Someone who has a personal stake in all of this is George Smitherman. He's a former deputy premier of Ontario and health minister who served in the liberal government of Premier Dalton McGuinty. He left provincial politics to run for mayor of Toronto in 2010, but lost to Rob Ford, the premier's late brother. After a break from politics, George Smitherman is now running for a seat on city council, and he joins me now live. George, welcome to you. Nice to see you, Carol. Can't get away from politics, can you? <laughs> I really miss it. I really miss <laughs> the people of politics. I want to talk to you about a couple of things tonight. One very political, one intensely personal, but I want to begin with the political. Uh, what's your reaction to the judge's decision that cutting city council from 47 to 25 members is a violation of the Constitution? Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm uh, someone that's in politics from a young age because of Pierre Trudeau. and. As a gay person, I've uh, celebrated the Charter of Rights and Freedoms frequently. And so at 8.05 this morning, I was uh, giving kudos to Pierre Trudeau on uh, another channel. And by later today, the notwithstanding clause, not the best feature of the uh, uh, repatriation of the Constitution, was dinner time conversation as I tried to explain to my husband, newly arrived from Cuba, and to our two small children, how Doug Ford could use a thing called a notwithstanding clause uh, to uh, fight back against a judge's ruling. So a remarkable day. And I spent how my life in politics. Yeah, how did you explain it? It's, I explained it like uh, the big king gets to overrule everybody else if he really, really, really wants to. But when they made the rule, the big king said that they wouldn't do it so often or something to that effect. I mean, it just, when I first saw it suggested on Twitter that he had a big bombshell coming first at 12 and then later at 2, I, I, I thought immediately, oh my goodness gracious, this man is unhinged. And his willingness to use a uh, method like this to uh, trump democracy in Toronto is it's stunning. It's Are you stunning. using the word Trump on purpose? The, the parallels, I'm sorry, some people say there aren't parallels. I think we saw today in his remarks that he is prepared to say anything and veracity is no longer uh, is no longer an issue and that's a lot of similarity with Trump. I think the one difference is Trump doesn't have to run the legislative side of things, and this guy does, and I think he's slow to figure it out. Where, where today do you think that our Premier was not truthful? Well, the Premier was not truthful as an example in suggesting that the judge was appointed by uh, Dalton McGuinty. I mean, that was just fodder for his crew, and I'll bet you if I look on Twitter, I can see a whole bunch of people repeating that. So that's just one, one example. And I think worse yet is seemingly his fundamental understanding of the law, of constitutional law, and of the idea that even though we may be democratically elected, it still means that our laws have to be in, in compliance uh, with uh, the constitution of the land. Here's and what I think you're referring to. Hold that thought for a second, and I'll let the audience take a listen to what Premier Ford said today about how Ontario will respond to, the respond to this court ruling. Take a listen. And I respect the courts. And the courts use every tool in their toolbox to make this happen. Well, guess what? I'm going to use every tool at our disposal to make sure we hold up the Constitution and the democratic right of the people of Ontario. George Smitherman, your reaction to that? Well, I think people can figure out for themselves. You could hear in his voice how excited he was to be going nuclear. I mean, it's just like the conversation that you saw the other day that people had to talk Donald Trump out of a preemptive strike on North Korea. And no one could talk this guy out of it and say, save that for another day. Keep your powder dry. You can still do this. You'll just have to wait a short while. I've met so many conservative people that support a move to 25 wards, but just really don't understand why that becomes the government's most urgent priority. Okay. It's, it's, it's in that sense, I think, quite shocking. Ontario legislature being called back to emergency session on Wednesday to debate and vote whether to use Section 33, the notwithstanding clause. Uh, what do you think will happen? Well, I, I went up there to see uh, if there's anyone amongst the uh, conservative backbench that has a backbone. He's given them a chance to have a free vote. I sent out an offer on Twitter for any MPP of any party that wants to come, or, come and wander around the territory of Toronto Centre, 110,000 people large, and just check out what municipal politics looks like in a territory that, that populous and that diverse but at the end of the day I have no doubt whatsoever that the train seals in his caucus are going to follow him forward they're taking an extraordinary delight in the 
punishment of Toronto. They okay. like it. You can see it in their body language. Okay, you're still planning to run for council. How did these changes affect you? <laughs> they affect me in a big way. And so far as uh, I was imagining to run in a in a part of uh, Toronto Centre that was a few neighborhoods, and that expands ex uh, exponentially, and also uh, puts people in a position where they'll be uh, running against folks that they might have otherwise not preferred to do so. Worst is, it makes the job rather untenable. And I said to my husband, I'm going to fight hard to win, but you know, this is uh, nighttime uh, work personified. And the volume of work that goes with meeting the expectations of local citizens to see their politician, to deal with the pothole, so to speak, or what have you, it's real. I was a provincial politician. I tried hard to be active at the community level, but I was outpaced regularly by city councillors. And uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to fulfill the needs and expectations of local communities in uh, Mr. Ford's imposed model. Okay. The second thing we wanted to talk to you tonight, George, is intensely personal, as I say, and it's in connection with World Suicide Prevention Day. In this country, as you know, approximately 4,000 Canadians Canada. take their own lives every year, and that's an average of 10 per day. 90% of those involve mental illness. Now, our guest tonight, George Smitherman, has a personal connection to this issue. In 2013, he lost his first husband, his late husband, Christopher Peloso, to suicide. George, I know it still must be painful for you, but take us back to what happened to Christopher. Well, Christopher was suffering uh, from depression, and uh, we've all seen it. You know, that's the one number one lesson I just say to people is, if, you, if you've lost contact with someone, they've dropped off the face of the earth seemingly, and they don't respond like they used to, that we should all try to be a bit more proactive. Uh, Christopher had uh, had depression and uh, it messes with one's brain chemistry in a way that it uh, uh, sends uh, uh, horribly uh, uh, horribly wrong messages and uh, you know that uh, that uh, tormented Christopher for a long time and he took his own life on uh, on De on December the 30th of 2013 and um, I've done a few hard things in my life Carol but explaining to a three-year-old and a five-year-old that their dad I wasn't coming home again uh, stands, uh, uh, stands amongst those. So on a day like today, I just want to try and send a message to uh, people who are suffering through despair, as I have in response to trauma in a number of ways, uh, that uh, there, are hope, there, there, there is hope and to not give up hope. And as a public, public person who experienced what many would hope to be this kind of most private experience the one thing about it is that so many people reached out to me and then told me their story my brother my sister my aunt or my uncle uh, passed away death by a suicide so we just have to take care of each other what is the biggest emotion that you have had to cope with uh, I think it's uh, I think it's just the response to loneliness um, the withdrawal the social isolation that comes with uh, with especially for me with solo parenting. I, I was at the Cabbage Down Festival on the weekend and many people said, oh, it's great to see you. Where have you been? You disappeared. I said, well, that's four and a half years of solo parenting. It, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, trying and it was lonely, but at the same time, uh, my kids were, uh, were and always will be, I think, uh, the greatest source of uh, strength. And, uh, and when you got kids to work for, you got a reason to put your feet on the floor every morning. Yeah. What are you? What would you say to somebody, George, who's who, who believe that they have a loved one, a family member, who they think might commit suicide? You know, there, uh, there's a, uh, there's a book that came out uh, that I think is being promoted uh, elsewhere. I think it's called uh, "A Bridge Over the River Y," and it's written by two parents who are dedicating a lot of love to survivor kids because they lost their child to a suicide and people should look in there for tips but the 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 one thing that i would say really is sometimes maybe it's a canadian thing i don't know sometimes we're a bit reserved in intervening and i think it's really really important that if if someone goes dark a communicator no longer communicates or disappears for a period of time that uh uh, I, I really recommend that uh, you reach out and uh, prod just a little, see if there is some means to get support for people or especially to make sure to try and penetrate that brain chemistry and let them know that they're loved and that they're needed and that they're necessary and that they most assuredly would be missed. Yeah, do you, do you feel, I, I wonder if, if people often feel 
responsible after it happens you know maybe I could have done more or should I've done this or should I've seen the signs I mean there must be a lot of a lot of soul searching that happens after somebody does commit suicide yeah it uh, cuts you to the quick and not just once of course and you ask yourself look at the treatment uh, regimen that we sought to address the symptoms that we saw I think Christopher would say that the mistake that we made is that we focused on symptoms, symptoms instead of the root issue, which was uh, depression. And uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, in my own sense also, because I had a, a history uh, on the political side of, uh, of, of you know, clinical matters as Minister of Health, also a tremendous amount of uh, questioning about the models that we have to support people. And I think there is a lot of new focus on mental health and, and addiction also, but we're still just scratching the surface in terms of addressing the ever-pressing needs that are out there for people who have suffered trauma of one form or another and have had no outlet to put it on the table and to discuss it and try and rationalize it or understand it or move past it. So we just got to give people as much of a chance to keep, get talking and keep talking. It sounds simple, but I think that's really the really a critical element. So reach out if someone's gone quiet. George Smitherman, former Ontario Deputy Premier and now a City Council candidate, thank you so much for joining me tonight. My pleasure. Thank you.